The next item of business is a debate on motion 14749 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on physical activity, diet and healthy weight. May I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. Uh, as you're already aware, time for this debate is already short, so I would ask that opening speakers do not go over the time that has been allocated. And I call Joe Fitzpatrick to speak to and move the motion for up to uh, no more than 13 minutes. Presenting officer, this government has been clear that it wants a fairer Scotland where everyone thrives. In moving the motion, um, I, I want to make the point that our overall aim is to improve the health of the nation, preventing ill health and reduce, reducing health inequalities are central to achieving that. In June this year, we published a set of six in interlinked public health priorities, each with prevention and early intervention at their core. They cover places and communities, the early years, mental well-being, alcohol, tobacco and drugs, poverty and healthy weight and physical activity. These priorities agreed between the government and COSLA are the most important things we must focus on over the next decade to improve the health of the people of Scotland. Today I want to out outline the step changes we as a government are taking to meet one of these public health priorities, a Scotland where we eat well and have a healthy weight and physical activity. In July, we published two complementary de delivery plans that set out what needs to be done to achieve that priority, while recognising that these plans sit alongside a wide range of government policy and action. Each delivery plan has stretched ambitions. We want to cut physical activity in adults and teenagers by 15% by 2030, in line with the new global goal put forward by the World Health Organization. We want to halve childhood obesity by 2030, and we want to significantly reduce diet-related health inequalities. We've set a high bar, and rightly so. The scale of the challenge is huge, and the inequalities remain persistently wide. These ambitions are underpinned by clear and comprehensive plans. I welcome the support from across the chamber in addressing these twin challenges. Today, we need to take action, decisive action, such as restricting junk food promotions and helping more women and girls to get involved in sport and physical activities. Let's remind ourselves why we need to act so urgently. We all know that being physically active is one of the best things we can do for our overall physical and mental well-being as an active lifestyle can, can help prevent heart disease, stroke, type two diabetes, musculoskeletal conditions, and a number of cancers. But it's about more than that. Physical activity has a unique power to inspire and motivate us. It can also play a crucial role in tackling social isolation and developing confidence. In short, being active is about all of us enjoying a healthy life and being connected to our communities and our environment. Overall levels of physical activity in Scotland remain steady while other developing countries show a decline. But given its many benefits, we want to go further and see these levels increase. The case for change is even more stark when it comes to diet and healthy weight. Let's be in no doubt about the scale of the challenge. We are, we are consistently failing to meet our dietary goals. 65% of adults are overweight or obese, and over a quarter, 26% of children are at risk of being overweight or obese. That is a shocking statistic, particularly given that overweight children are more likely to become overweight adults with all the health inequality that that brings. Obesity is the second biggest preventable cause of cancer after smoking. It's the most significant risk factor for type two diabetes, and it can also increase the risk of lots of conditions, including cardiovascular diseases and arthritis. If we can bring down obesity and drive up physical activity, we can prevent the burden of health harms on our children, adults, and on the NHS. And people of Scotland will lo live longer, healthier, happier lives. Looking across both plans, they have three core priorities. They both seek to address health inequalities by supporting everyone to have active lifestyles and healthy diets. They both recognize the importance of collective leadership and broad ownership nationally and locally, across public, private, third and community sectors. And they both prioritise cross-portfolio approaches to ensure policies across the government, and not just in health, support the changes that are needed. Let me turn to, in detail to each of the plans. So in July, I launched Scotland's Physical Activity Delivery Plan, A More Active Scotland. It sets out a range of actions, 90 in total, 
that we and our delivery partners are taking to encourage and support people in Scotland to be more active more often. Partnership working is a central theme. A plan follows the publication of the World Health Organization's Global Action Plan on Physical Activity. The WHO plan sets the challenges countries around the world face in helping people to get and stay active. And it highlights how, many, how so many aspects of modern life, including transport, technology, changes in work and leisure activities, lead us towards inactivity. The WHO plan makes clear that a whole system approach is crucial to success. That means working across policy boundaries to improve education, transport, health, planning, sports sectors, amongst others. I'm extremely pleased that the World Health Organization has welcomed our delivery plan and it sees Scotland as ahead of the game in responding to their global action plan, of course. My yeah, glass of water. Um, I was just wondering, would the Minister um, say to Parliament what his view is? Um, here in Edinburgh, for example, the, uh, the SNP Labour-controlled Edinburgh City Council are looking to increase proposed high, uh, price hikes on local groups to undertake for uh, sports and sports clubs. Does he think that will achieve the outcomes of his delivery plans? Joe Fitzpatrick. Clearly, clearly um, local government are partners in what we're trying to do and I, I was pleased when Edinburgh Council said that we would look again at, at those matters and I understand that is still um, the, the, the status there, that, that, that has been looked at. Um, so when we look at the delivery action plan, the actions um, in which physical activity and sport can transform lives across all ages um, and demographics. So the actions included in the plan include rolling out the Daily Mile across the country, doubling active travel budgets to 80 million to encourage walking and cycling for recreation and travel, increasing um, support for participation in sport by women and girls, one million pounds for changing lives through sport and physical activity, increasing funding support for older people in care uh, setting to remain physically active. And an important point as part of the amendment which um, Mr Cole Hamilton will be speaking to later. That's only a snapshot of the actions we're taking forward and we'll continue to work with academics and practitioners to learn from the evidence and share experience on what works on the ground. Physical activity is one factor in maintaining a healthy weight, but it is only one factor. So in July, which was a, a busy month for me, just in post, I also launched our diet and healthy weight delivery plan, A Healthier Future. It sets out a wide ranging approach to tackle the nation's, healthy, health, nation's weight problem. So obesity is complex, but our aim is simple. We want to make it much easier for everyone across Scotland to eat well and have a healthy weight. The delivery plan has over 60 actions, but today I want to focus on three core priorities. Transforming the food environment, giving children the best start in life, and preventing type 2 diabetes. So starting with the, the transforming the food environment, um, in particular around promotions, as a nation we consume too much food and drink that has little or no nutritional benefit, but which contributes calories or salt to our diet. These so-called discretionary foods include snacks like crisps, sweets and chocolate, Half of the sugar consumed in Scotland comes from these sort of foods. So it's clear that we need to eat less of them. But it's difficult to make healthier choices when we're constantly bombarded with messages that encourage us to impulse buy these foods and to overconsume them. So we want to change that. We're looking to restrict the in-store marketing and promotion of discretionary foods so that they can't be sold on multi-buy promotions or um, placed at checkouts, for example. The consultation is already underway um, on a comprehensive set of proposals on which we welcome feedback. Like all big public health in interventions, we know we need to take the public with us. The latest Food Standards Scotland data shows that around half support restricting the promotion of unhealthy products, um, but we are not complacent. We will continue to make the case for change so that consumer feels empowered to make healthier choices. Transforming the food environment in my Transforming the food environment involves much more than this, of course. For example, we're also supporting Scottish SMEs to reformulate products and remove calories. We're urging the UK government to ban the broad broadcast um, of advertising of HFSS foods before the 9pm watershed. And Food Standards Scotland will shortly uh, publish its consultation on how restaurants, cafes, delivery services and others can support healthier eating, for example, by better calorie labelling. Our ambition to half childhood obesity gives our plan a strong preventative focus. Of course, all changes to the food environment that I've talked about should improve the diet of children and their families. But this is 
there's much more that we can do and we must do because early childhood, in, in fact, what happens before children are born is criti critical time for establishing huge nutrition and healthy eating. And we'll support parents in preconception and in the early years with everything from pregnancy nutrition to breastfeeding and weaning. We'll, we'll serve healthier food to children in early year settings at school. We'll target services for families who need it and the, the, weight, the child's weight is a concern. And we'll continue to support children and families through school and the teenage years. While our overarching aim is to stop children becoming overweight or obese in the first place, we nevertheless recognise um, that the current reality, that's being, being overweight or obese, has become the norm for adults in Scotland. And among that comes the, the associated, associated health harms and the significant pressures these put on health services. Each year, we spend around 9% of our total health expenditure treating type 2 diabetes, a condition closely related with overweight and obesity. But there's growing evidence that with significant and sustained changes to diet and lifestyle, a diagnosis, diagnosis of type 2 diabetes can be reversed. That's why our, pri our third priority is our significant investment of £42 million over five years to tackle type 2 diabetes. In the summer, I also published a prevention framework which sets clear expectations on health boards and their partners to provide services to support these, those with or at risk of um, often avoidable conditions. Presiding officer, this is an issue that we can all unite on in the, in the worlds of health and community and well-being. Politicians, policy makers, community leaders and medical professionals around a programme of action that will add years to the healthy life expectancy of people in Scotland. Since July, we've already achieved a great deal with strong commitment from a wide range of local and national partners. But this is just the start. We need to continue to build leadership and momentum across the system such as the scale and nature of, of the problem, we want to ensure that we have the strongest possible plan for action for Scotland and for future generations. And that means continuing to learn from others and to evolve our thinking. I therefore welcome the, the, um, the debate we've got today and I welcome the, the, the tone of the amendments. Um, I can confirm that we will be supporting the Conservatives amendment, um, which um, is, is in line with, with the strategies. Um, the, the Liberal Democrats amendment is, is a commitment we've also given and it, and it makes sense within the context here. Unfortunately, we aren't able to support the, the Labour amendment because it removes reference to the, the two delivery plans. And I, I think the, the, the Green Party, um, the, the asking the Green Party's amendment relate to, to budget matters, which we will we'll come to, to later, but um, uh, good try. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I <laughs> 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 thanks to everyone for the, the, the constructive way that I know that they intend to take part in the debate. Thank you. Could you formally move your motion, please, Minister? I moved it in my very first sentence. Did you? I wasn't listening closely enough. Very sorry. <laughs> I now move to uh, Brian Whittle and call him to speak to and move Amendment 14749.1 for no more than eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I, I do welcome the opportunity to open this debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. I'd like to thank the Scottish Government for the opportunity to debate this, which I think is the most important topic we can today. Um, the fact that we have physical activity and nutrition on the parliamentary agenda is very welcome, and at last brings, to, uh, at last brings us to recognise that there is a major health issue in Scotland, and we can affect that in this place. So, Presiding Officer, we will be supporting uh, the Government motion, but in doing so, also recognising this should only be the start uh, of a conversation and there is much more action that we could and should be taking to make the impact we all know is necessary. Uh, this is the thrust uh, of the Scottish Conservative Amendment to the Government motion which I now move uh, in my name. When we're looking uh, at tackling the preventable, preventable agenda, uh, its very basis is rooted in good nutrition, being physically active and inclusivity. Now, over a year ago, the Scottish Conservatives called for any monies raised from uh, the sugar tax to be allocated to a programme keeping schools open during school holidays to offer that uh, activity hub with a healthy meal included because we know that uh, health inequalities and food bank usage uh, spike uh, during school holidays. And we have to say that, that uh, uh, the Labour amendment for us is too restrictive uh, uh, and, and actually uh, it, it would prevent other, uh, other uh, possibilities of keeping a whole day, for example, uh, of activity uh, there. So we can't, uh, uh, although we, we recognise the direction of travel we want to go in, we couldn't support that amendment. As convener of the uh, musculoskeletal and arthritis CPG, you won't be surprised that I'll be supporting the Lib Dem amendment. 
uh, although we are hugely sympathetic to the Green Amendment and certainly want to pursue that kind of policy uh, at this time, uh, we would be reticent to put, to, to put a figure on it, so we couldn't support that either. So, uh, Presenting Officer, the, the conversation has to change. Uh, we need to stop focusing, I think, so intently on the symptoms. The conditions are rising as a result of poor lifestyle choices. Uh, and, and we were to, to focus on the fact that Scotland needs a better relationship with uh, food, drink and physical activity. And if we follow this argument, it then leads us to that ease of access to and understanding of uh, good nutrition and physical activity and the environment in which it takes place. We can then begin to break down those barriers to inclusion and have that much more positive uh, conversation. And I believe there are many levers available to the Scottish Government that would not require huge budgetary commitments but could have a significant long-lasting impact. I think the educational environment should be a key battleground in delivering that healthier future for Scotland, from a nursery education right through to higher education. When considering physical and nutritional education, we need to look at not only the learning environment, but how we ensure that learning can be applied. Physical education is about how to be physically active and why we should be physically active. We then need to ensure that that learning can be applied outside, uh, outside of the school day. So connecting physical education with extracurricular activity and, and a community offer, I think is of paramount importance. Likewise, with nutritional education, it's not enough uh, to learn in theory. I think pupils must be given the opportunity to apply that learning in practice. Certainly increasing home economics offer would be a good start, along with improving the quality of school meals. Allowing pupils input into the school meal menu affords that buy-in and perhaps even allow pupils into the school kitchen, uh, which they are actually doing in Japan and, and Copenhagen, um, among other, uh, other places. I need to, you need to explain to me why we export so much of uh, our high-quality Scottish produce and import uh, lower-grade, cheaper product, produce into the Excel public procurement contract. I don't think it doesn't make particular sense to me. But looking outside of, uh, of the environment adjacent to schools, we need to look at the planning departments and be cognizant of where we license, where we, we give licenses for fast food, fast food restaurants, uh, look at preventing food vans from parking close to schools. And I think consider at what age we should allow our children to leave school premises. Now, I, I would like to say I, I have no problem with fast food. I do, however, have a huge issue when it becomes part of a staple diet. And I say on Monday I drove past the school in Kilmarnock at lunchtime and noticed three food vans parked at the school gate with pupils queuing at all three of them. Now in East Ayrshire, as, as we know, it, it's a gold standard when it comes to locally procured, procured food and that quality of food that's served. So we need to try and understand what drives this kind of behaviour. Certainly the food vans just being there is a big factor. And surely this is something where a simple solution is obvious change the environment and include our school pupils in developing of school meals. And this applies uh, from preschool, actually pre-birth, as, as the minister said, all the way through uh, life. Start with that active play framework in nursery, along with perhaps the old vegetable patch in the grounds, tended by the children. I think this active, inclusive and educational approach would speak directly to attainment. Early intervention directly tackles the situation where children are reaching primary school age are already two years behind in their learning. I think to achieve this, we also must then start looking at how we would deliver these step changes, because without a delivery mechanism, all we are here is a talking shop. I've always said that we, we, the first thing we need to do is look after the health of our healthcare professionals. How, how can we expect our healthcare professionals to deliver on this message when their working environment in and itself is a barrier to them adopting a healthy, active lifestyle? I think the other thing we need to do is look at freeing up our, our, our teachers' time uh, to allow them to deliver the education that they can and are trained to do, but it is because it's through them that this paradigm shift in culture can be achieved. We also must be recognised the third sector has a huge part to play in this agenda. We're all aware of the value they deliver to our communities. However, how they are funded and aligned, I think, must be reviewed and ensure that they can deliver what they are capable of. What also needs to be thought of is how a national increase in physical activity would actually, actually be catered for. Dr. Frank Dick, who's uh, the, the former director of coaching at UKA and chair of the European Coaches Association, wrote a paper on offering upskilling to those approaching retirement age to allow them to continue to use their lifetime of experience and skills in the third sector should they so wish. I, I would agree with him that this is a largely untapped resource 
which we should be promoting both for the, their continued health and the well-being of those they would be working with. And there's also a possibility of developing the younger age group who have an interest in being involved, but perhaps not necessarily as a sports person, affording them this opportunity in the later school years to gain a coaching qualification can be both empowering and engaging. Education is the solution to health and welfare. I've always believed that. We have to create that environment where we all have access to that education in, in the wider context, be that in the classroom or outside, and that, there has to be, and that has to be irrespective of background or personal circumstance. That's why I believe the school estate has to be utilised much more effectively. It makes no sense to have to go home to go somewhere else to participate in sport and activity when the easiest access to quality opportunity is where the pupils are at the end of the school day. Fish where the fish are. In supporting the government motion and thanking them for bringing this debate to the chamber, we recognise that their motion only tackles one element of a more complicated system. Uh, we are, we are uh, uh, presenting officer, in the starting blocks. So let us have no false starts. The Scottish Conservatives look forward to working with the government in developing a strategy to tackle what I believe is the most important issue facing Scotland today. I now call David Stewart to speak to and move amendment 14749.3 for no more than seven minutes please Mr Stewart. Uh, thank you President Officer and I move the amendment in my name. I, I welcome this afternoon's uh, debate. Clearly lack of physical activity and obesity is a modern day public health crisis and it's one that would be unrecognisable to Scots who lived through the rationing in the Second World War or even a century before that, when parishes had to set up poor houses from Shetland to Selkirk. And I share the view of Martin Cohen of the University of Hertfordshire, who stated, and I quote, obesity is invariably presented as a diet issue for dietitians, whereas social inequality is deemed the domain of sociologists and economists. Put another way, even as the inequality gap becomes more and more obvious, there's been a medicalization of social problems Yet obesity is not just a matter for dietitians, rather is a product of the social inequality and requires a collective social response. And we all know, and the Minister has said this in his remarks, that obesity has been on the rise for decades. And it's no wonder. Changes in our lifestyles have had inescapable repercussions for our diets. The increasing fast pace of life has meant we're more likely to buy quick and easy meals, frequently trading nutritious food for efficiency. So this shift in our eating habits inevitably means we are taking in more sugar, more salt and more fat than we need. And to compile the problem, the busyness of life means fewer and fewer of us are active enough to burn off these calories, which causes what scientists call uh, obesogenic environments. So in 2016, for example, only 64% of those over 16 are estimated to have reached their recommended amount of physical activity each week. The result is a country which is one of the worst records in the OECD, and two-thirds of Scottish adults are classed as overweight. And even more worrying, about a third of children are also overweight. And we all know that the consequences of endemic obesity are severe. For individuals, being overweight comes with numerous increased chronic health risks and reduces life expectancy by an average of three years. And I commend, presiding officer, the work of Cancer Research UK and Obesity Action Scotland, who are working hard to raise awareness, both here and with the public, of the link between being overweight and developing cancers. And as one of the co-chairs of the cross-party group in diabetes, I think my other colleagues are also in the chamber today, uh, I'm glad that the government in the motion has referred to type 2 diabetes. As members will know, being classed as obese or overweight is a significant contributing factor to developing uh, type 2. And with the obesity crisis, it's unfortunately no surprise that the figure in the disease makes for bleak reading. I looked at the up-to-date figures just last night, and a number of colleagues here were at a dinner that I chaired about diabetes. In Scotland today, 260,000 people are diagnosed with type 2. But what really concerns me, half a million in Scotland are at risk of developing the condition. And members will all be familiar with this. But just to restate it, with a diagnosis of type 2 can come serious complications, including the risk of blindness and amputation. Besides, of course, the clear and grave impact on individuals' quality of life. This growing disease, which is one example of the strain that obesity places on the National Health Service resources. And the Minister will be aware of the financing around this. £1 billion is spent by the NHS 
on tackling diabetes, and 80% of that goes in managing avoidable complications. So I support the government's proposal to invest in weight management programmes with a long-term goal is, is very welcome. Stefan. Ryan Whittle. Very grateful to the member to take an intervention in, in discussing preventable health. I think I mentioned to the member last night, I, I wonder if you'd agree, I read in a magazine that uh, paternal physical activity has a huge impact on the metabolic rate of our children. So when we're talking about prevention, we need to be cognizant of, of what, what parents are doing pre-birth. Yeah, David Stewart. I, I bow down to the member's experience in that particular issue, but I think it makes a very good point, one that was reinforced, I think, at a diabetes uh, dinner last night. So I, I agree with what the government's done on weight management, so, but obviously tangible improvement is likely to be short-lived unless we take preventative approach. Evidence-based action is absolutely crucial. It's important to know what we're trying to do is working. And Diabetes Scotland Minister have um, raised a concern with me about the budget cuts to the teams currently collecting clinical data. This could undermine the assessment of the programme. Perhaps the Minister will have a look at that um, in, in the wind-up. I'm very conscious of time, um, President Officer, but it is good to see that the government is seriously considering how advertising promotions of food high in fat, sugar and salt can be restricted. So the key to such an approach will not be just to negatively restrict unhealthy foods, but also to make the option of balanced diet uh, much more practical. However, the key issue for me is although this challenge may look modern, under the surface, the root problems of this is the same old story, and that is poverty, social deprivation, and inequality are significant contributors to being overweight, and it's the least well-off who are most at risk. For example, a quarter of all the children living in the most deprived areas are at risk of obesity, compared to only 17% in the least deprived areas. So we have a major health inequality, and I do agree with the points made by Brian Whittle about using the planning system um, to ensure that community spaces can encourage physical activity, are welcoming and in safe. So in conclusion, President Officer, uh, the key to tackling obesity is seeing it not just as a problem for individuals and families, but a social problem, similar to educational achievement or criminality. Poverty, not individual choices, is the driver of the problem. Thus, only fundamental societal change that will fight inequality will cut the Gordian knot of systematic overindulgence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Stewart. And I call Alison Johnson to speak to and move amendment 14749.4 for up to six minutes. Thank you, presiding officer, and I begin by moving the amendment in my name. And I'd also like to thank all the many organisations who've provided briefings for this afternoon's debate. Um, I too am glad to discuss the systemic change we need so that people can live more active, healthier lives, and to see a range of amendments today which present different but complementary ideas to help us achieve that. It's fair to say that a real challenge confronts us. The proportion of people in Scotland who meet guidelines for physical activity hasn't much changed since 2012. Just about two thirds of us manage moderate levels of physical activity for two and a half hours per week. And though the overall proportion of, of adults who are overweight or obese appears not to have increased since 2008, nor has there been the positive reduction that we all want to see. Over the last decade, we've certainly learned that public health messages focused on individual behaviours tend to fail, and fail people on lower incomes in particular, as David Stewart has stressed. And they can also cause unintended harm by stigmatising some behaviours and some bodies. When discussing the social determinants of health, Professor Michael Marmot often reminds us of alternative health messages we could be giving people. Instead of telling someone to follow a balanced diet and keep active, we might advise them not to be poor. And if they can't avoid that, then try not to be too poor for too long. Or don't live in a deprived area and don't work in a stressful, low-paid manual job. That kind of parody indicates just how much of our health is determined by factors that we, as individuals, can do fairly little to control. Yet in 2018, we're a long way from seeing public health campaigns on our trains and buses announcing that poverty is a risk factor for poorer health. So it's time for a better approach, um, absolutely. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. I, mean, I very much agree with what she's saying, but would you accept that actually sometimes uh, the healthier food can be cheaper than the takeaway uh, expensive food, and there's also an education process in this? Alison Johnson. Um, 
the, the, the member makes an interesting point, but we have to remember too that in some parts of our more deprived communities, we have what are described as food deserts, where it's simply impossible to have that access to, to the fresh fruit and vegetable at an affordable price that we might enjoy. Um, so I, I think it's clear that we need to begin to use regulation to tackle our obesogenic environment and make meaningful investment in our infrastructure. And I think most amendments today reflect that focus. My amendment concentrates on the urgent need to improve spending on walking and cycling. It's been helpful that previous spending was doubled, but £80 million is still a small proportion of our overall transport budget, some 3 to 4%. Now, Greens have a long-standing policy um, that the transport budget, active travel, should be at least 10% of that budget. We want to see spending brought up to £25 per head, bringing us on a par with spending levels of the Netherlands, one of the most cycle-friendly countries in the world. Um, I, I, I'll address the Minister's remarks when I, when I have the opportunity to close. In Utrecht, for example, cycling is the dominant form of transport with 51% of everyday journeys made by bike. This would begin to redress a lack of investment in everyday local transport for the third of people who don't have access to a car. And it also tackles two of the biggest barriers to becoming physically active, and those are cost and time. The increase in the active travel budget for 2018-19 is welcome, and it has been effective in generating more activity in local communities to deliver walking and cycling infrastructure. Yet still, local authorities, particularly those with large urban areas, have indicated a desire for match funding, for more match funding than can currently be accessed. Increasing the active travel budget from the current level of £15 a head to £25 a head, as called for in our amendment, could trigger the transformational change in cycling infrastructure that could make Scotland a mass participation cycling nation with long distance and recreational trips, safe, simple, convenient and frequent. So we do need a stronger focus on infrastructure, but while we work on that, I think we could build on popular successful approaches like the cycle to work scheme. We could rule out cycle to college, cycle to uni, giving students better access to bike ownership through interest-free bike loans integrated into student funding. That would give all students an opportunity to start the semester with a bike of their choice and plan healthier, cheaper, cheaper travel to and from lectures. Getting into healthy habits when we leave school for work, college or university can have a positive impact for decades and I'd like to see more support for young people going through these important transitions. I think expanding, I think expanding the Daily Mile programme is the only measure in the physical activity delivery plan that mentions colleges and universities, spe universities specifically and it seems that there is a missed opportunity there. But I am glad to see that the Scottish Funding Council will be developing a new approach to diet and weight for staff and students. I have strong support for the emphasis the Labour motion places on the need to tackle holiday hunger. Um, the Greens are certainly advocates for the universal provision of free school meals beyond primary three. And, and Brian Whittles touched on the need to have you know, better school kitchens and dining facilities. I was pleased to welcome the Copenhagen House of Food to Parliament years ago. And, what is going on there it truly is an inspirational model well worth looking at. And we too, we have to protect children and young people from the very worst aspects of an unhealthy food industry. Um, I will wrap up there, presiding officer, but just to finish by saying, you know, we have to restrict irresponsible promotions on very unhealthy food. And we really need to get to grips with that. Thank you. I call Alex Cole Hamilton to speak to and move amendment 14749.2. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. I think on days like today, when there are tectonic shifts in politics in Westminster and across Europe, it's possible for uh, outside observers to look at this debate and see it as being somewhat prosaic, but it isn't. It isn't at all, and it's right that we come back to these almost like seasonal fixtures because it is something that we are all charged with obtaining progress on. I'm very grateful to the government for bringing its very uh, conciliatory motion forward today and happy to support all parties' amendments uh, at decision time tonight. It is right that we come back to this issue because it does offer us common ground. I think we all share the same aims and objectives and we won't lose sight of the challenge that lies ahead of us because that challenge is visited in our constituency surgeries uh, relating to health complaints or mobility complaints every single week because presiding officer 
large swathes of our population are locked into a trajectory, a vicious cycle, which re both reduces the orbit of their social universe, it harms their mental health, and it ultimately cuts short on their life ex uh, expectancy. So these debates can be, yes, an act of contrition, because since this parliament was first convened, we have sought to end the reality that through confluence of our culture, our weather, and particular brands of social inequality, this is still a nut that we are yet to crack. People eat more and are less active than in most other countries. But it is something we come to together. But when, so I don't as seek to ascribe any blame for this on any particular administration or political viewpoint, but recognize for a multiplicity of reasons that it is woven into the fabric of our country's makeup and how we unpick that will define the measure of our efforts in this area for years to come. And the challenge is huge. Um, being overweight is, as we know, the uh, second biggest risk to health and early death after cancer. And despite that reality, only a quarter of our fellow Scots are aware of that link. And the scale of this is eye-watering. Presiding officer, if you had, uh, if, well, if you had 65% of adults and 29% of children contracted a potentially fatal virus, it would trigger the emergency mobilization of the World Health Organization and an international aid response. Because the costs of our society uh, as well uh, is equally large for obesity and inactivity, they've been estimated at upwards of four billion pounds. So as the cabinet, said, oh, as the, the minister said, that our response to this had to be whole nation, whole place solutions. And that whether that's in reducing the 110 tons of sugar which are ingested by our population every year, whether that's through reformulation, product awareness and information. It's about in the promotion of activity and active travel. I'm very happy to support Alison Johnson's amendment. I will speak to that again in, in closing. And how we teach our children and make them aware of what a healthy, adequate lifestyle looks like. But it's also about recognizing that link, and it's been drawn several times between obesity, inactivity, social isolation, and social exclusion, the links between poverty and social deprivation. And that speaks very much to the thrust of my amendment. Again, it seems quite prosaic to talk about a full strategy, but fear of falling is reducing the orbit of people's social universe. And we need to recognize that, and we need to do something collectively to address that. Because social isolation and inactivity are definitely bedfellows. 65,000 Scots will spend Christmas alone this year. 200,000 Scots go four days or more without contact with another human being. And this has an impact undeniably on both physical and mental health. The 19th century French writer Balzac said, solitude is fine, but you need somebody to tell you that it's fine. Now we can't magic social connections out for these people out of thin air, but we can reduce the barriers to do them doing that for themselves. In 2017, I chaired a meeting of the Older People's Assembly in this very room, and I asked them at one point about what they were most frightened. I was expecting uh, criminality or disease or frailty, but actually, universally, the, the number one thing about people, what people were most frightened was falling um, because it reduces the size of their social universe, because they know that life expectancy after a hip fracture is dramatically reduced. People in our communities, and I'm sure I speak for every member in this room who has people coming into their surgeries day in, day out, saying they have no confidence in the fidelity of pavements or the surety of pavements or street corners in their communities. There are accident hotspots that we all know something about. Now, my amendment calls on the Scottish Government to build on the Falls framework of 2014, which looked at full reduction uh, and uh, early intervention in medical settings to expand that out into our local community, to work with sport and leisure trusts and local authorities to identify accident black spots because it particularly at this time of year, as the nights draw in and the frost starts to bite, it is now more than ever that people decide elect to stay at home rather than take the risk of having a fall in their communities. And if we get that right, we can get them back into their communities, we can get them into social networks, and we can get them into the opportunities for physical activity, something of which we've heard this afternoon. So I take great pleasure in moving my amendment, and I look forward to supporting all the other amendments tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cole Hamilton. We now move on to the, the open debate and its speeches of up to five minutes, please. Bruce Crawford, followed by Liz Smith.
Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government's motion that we're debating today sets out the benefits of improved physical activity and healthy eating. A healthier health lifestyle can benefit overall health and well-being. And my goodness, as a nation, do we need to have this debate? Level, levels of type 2 diabetes have already heard from people like Dave Stewart. Heart disease and other illnesses, including many types of cancer associated with obesity, are stubbornly high in Scotland, and they've been that way for years. This frankly puts a strain on our hard-pressed National Health Service, our other public services, our economy, and it's, that's something we could well do without. That's why I very much welcomed the publishing of the Scottish Government's Healthier Future, Scotland's Diet and Healthy Weight Delivery Plan earlier this year. So, there's some great work going on across Scotland trying to address some of these issues. And I want to use just a bit of my time in this debate to, to highlight some of the quite remarkable initiatives and fantastic organisations operating in my own constituency who are contributing positively towards the government's plan. Now, of course, it's true to say that Stirling has some of the most beautiful and stunning landscapes that exist anywhere in our, this wonderful country of ours, home to an impressive array of Monroe's, Corbett's, Graham's and Donald's, as well as spectacular lochs. And because of that inspiring landscape, it's an attractive and popular place for hikers, hill walkers, kayakers and cyclists, etc. The perfect place and setting to promote a healthy, outdoor, active lifestyle. Now, Stirling, of course, is also home to the now internationally recognised Daily Mile, pioneered by St Ninian's Primary School from 2012 and was the brainchild of the then head teacher, Elaine Wiley. The scheme encourages all pupils to walk, jog or run a mile each day and is in addition to the usual PE exercise that they undertake. And a study from Stirling, Edinburgh and Highlands and Islands Universities showed clear evidence that this daily mile approach can help combat not only problems in Scotland, but global problems. I understand that now over 3,500 schools across more than 30 countries around the world now take part in this remarkable initiative. What a success story, which began in St Ninian's in the city of Stirling. So not all is gloom and doom in this area, although it's very challenging, we know that. And earlier this year, the Scottish Government said it wanted Scotland to be the first Daily Mail nation, with nurses, nurseries, colleges, universities and workplaces joining over 800 primary schools and regularly taking part. And as the Minister has already said, the Scottish Government's aim is to cut physical inactivity in adults and teenagers by 15% by 2030. And that equates to around a quarter of a million more people becoming active. So perhaps in his summing up, the Minister could say a bit more about how that ambition can be realised and reached. Can I say just a very quick few words about Next Bike in Stirling? That is a highly innovative bike share scheme. And Next Bike is now providing 160 bikes across 23 bike stations in the city of Stirling, available 24 seven. And it's yet another advertisement about how they can, we can go about having that active lifestyle. Now, President Lewis, I wanted to say a bit more on other things, but I want to turn to healthy eating. And on that matter, we are being watched very carefully um, at the, by Philip Sim in the BBC. Because Philip just tweeted, MSPs are debating diet and healthy weight on macaroni cheese day in the canteen. <laughs> so everyone is making speeches about eating well, mere hours after half the people in the building gorge themselves on I'm pasta, chips and garlic bread. Only if you're going to serve me macaroni and cheese. Well, I wasn't going to. Annabel Ewing. I, I, I have to say, President Officer, but I'd be rather curious now the member has raised it. Did the member have macaroni and cheese for lunch? No, uh, excuse me, Mr Crawford, can I put on record that I didn't take chips? <laughs> well, Bruce Crawford. I didn't have it only because I didn't spot it was on, because it's one of my favourites. I just think there's a place for that. You know, it's, it's, I don't think we should decry that as a good food. It's how we do, it's, the, the issue is how we may go about finding a balanced uh, process in terms of what we eat. Now, Members will be aware that the Food Assembly and uh, their shock announcement earlier this year to pull out of the UK, um, that was a concerning time for all involved in, this, in the Food Assemblies, but I'm glad to say that Stirling Food, food Assembly has st is still working hard to promote and sell fresh local produce. And I was delighted the when the organisers announced they'd be staying put in Stirling. They hold pickup markets at Stirling High School, and I understand the Food Assembly now has 
over 200 members. I don't have any time left, but I still want to give some, play some tribute to the Royal Highland Education Trust does in working with food producers and the agriculture industry to educate children about where their food comes from, which is so important. Thank you. Liz Smith, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Deputy Presiding Officer, and uh, can I uh, warmly congratulate the member who's just spoken because I think Stirlingshire has led the way on uh, so many aspects of uh, good news stories when it comes to uh, health and uh, just educating our youngsters on that, not just because of your wonderful manoes that you do have in Stirlingshire, which I've had the privilege of climbing several times over in some cases. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, the very first Education Committee inquiry that I took part in in this place when I was uh, first elected was the debate about whether or not we should introduce free school meals in primaries one to three. And aside from all the politics of that debate, and there were certainly plenty of them, but they're still uh, going on, there was some fascinating evidence from around uh, the country, from south of the border, and other countries about what interventions had actually helped our very youngest people to eat more healthily. And one piece of evidence stood out for me, and that was the very marked improvement when schools encouraged pupils and parents to be involved in the setting of menus. And when these menus made good use of the locally sourced food, and uh, Brian Whittle uh, has referred earlier to the current initiatives that are taking place in Japan and in Denmark, where pupils are actually able to access uh, the kitchen to help. And in particular, the evidence which has been presented since that time, I think has been striking for many rural schools whose local food is so much part of the farming community uh, that actually surrounds their school. And of course, there's a lesson to be learnt from the uh, very recent story that I saw in the Press and Journal that the school uh, cook, I think it was from Broadford Primary School, was nominated for two special awards for her absolutely outstanding work um, promoting healthy eating at a school that was inspiring youngsters to further educate themselves in nutrition. So I think the early evidence that we took at the Education Committee has stuck with me all the time that I've been an elected member. And also, as I look at some of the school meals, which have um, perhaps been a bit less than satisfactory, because I think the argument is sometimes put to us that it's more expensive uh, to prepare very healthy meals because there's less scope for uh, mass purchasing and therefore less scope for economies of scale when it comes to preparing and transporting the food. I have to say I completely and wholly refute that view. But what I do accept is that many school kitchens have not always been particularly suitable for the kind of meal preparation which I think we need in modern schools. And I think that's an important part uh, for us all to think about when it comes to uh, procurement. Of course. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to the member for giving way. I wonder if the member agrees with me that as well as improving diets within school canteens, we need to educate children about the journeys that the foodstuffs that they can ingest at lunchtime have been on to get to their plate. Liz Smith. Uh, yes, absolutely, I do agree. Um, I, I think that's all part of the whole educational journey for uh, youngsters. Um, but I think the key thing is, you know, what happens in school um, when they're having their lunch or, uh, in some cases, breakfast, that I think, you know, we, we have to ensure that there is an improvement in the quality of the healthy food that is actually uh, being delivered to them. Because, you know, mem members who've already spoken in this um, debate say, it, you know, it's a damning indictment of Scotland's health uh, that we have the lowest life expectancy, not only in, in the United Kingdom, but also in Western Europe. And obviously, um, it, it, I think it was the 2017 uh, Audit Scotland report found that so many of the key trends when it comes to the overall health in Scotland um, is not really improving in the way that we would like. Which is why, as the Conservative uh, uh, spokesman in education, I really do think we have to focus on the diet and the nutrition aspects of today's uh, motion. Um, I know I haven't got very much time, so I just want to uh, finish with uh, a few thoughts. Um, I think we all very much welcome the fact that one of the uh, key outcomes in the Diet and Healthy Weight Plan is the emphasis that's being placed uh, on children having the very best and very earliest start in life by eating well and having a healthy weight. Because children uh, who do have that, it's very clear that they um, do much better at school apart from anything else, and that's irrespective of uh, where they come from and uh, their income background. And I think the Conservatives' uh, Healthy life st Lifestyle Strategy, which was published uh, by Brian Whittle last year, was very much founded on the belief that these issues have cross-party and also uh, cross-portfolio 
emphasis, whether it's health or education or planning or housing, and that there are three very much interconnected pillars on which a policy must be based. Nutrition, the educational environment and physical activity, they all are part and parcel of the same thing. Uh, and in particular, the education deputy presiding officer is very much the solution to improving health and welfare, irrespective of who we are. I call Stuart Stevenson, followed by Ian Gray. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. And I very much welcome hearing that Philip Sim uh, is watching the debate. I know how much he enjoys my uh, contributions. And uh, let me just say uh, to Bruce Crawford that in uh, 1945, uh, the ration for cheese was two ounces a week. So there'd be very little prospect of having macaroni cheese uh, very, very often. And indeed, research that was done in 1939 uh, at the very beginning of the war showed that one could live and thrive on one pound of meat a week, quarter a pint of milk a day, four ounces of margarine, and as much potatoes, vegetables, and bread as you could eat. And that was all you needed to survive on. Um, although, it did, although the experiment did report that there was a substantial increase in flatulence. Speaking of which, David da Stewart. <laughs> David Stewart. <laughs> thank, uh, thank you, for the, thank the member for line intervention. What was the member's experience of living through the Boer War? Stuart um, Stevenson. I'm never bored by any debate on the subject of food, because of food, food realistically has become a hobby for many of us, rather than a way of living uh, our lives. Um, I, of course, uh, am a little bit older than apart from one person in the chamber at the moment, um, and I do remember uh, the, no, that way. I, I do remember uh, uh, the, the ending of sugar rationing, uh, in February 1953, when I was uh, six years old. And the ration for sweetie, it's sweeties at that point uh, was actually 11 grams a day. And just to translate that into what something meaningful, that means in today's terms, you could have a Mars bar every five days. Total, nothing more, that was it. And we were actually a great deal healthier when our food intake was controlled by the state. I don't advocate a return to that, but it illustrates how much of our food intake is, is optional, is voluntary, and unnecessary. Oh, the equivalent of that, by the way, I should say, is that one can of Coke every three days has got the sugar content uh, of the 1953 uh, ration. So therefore, I and others of my generation probably have less of a sweet tooth. And hopefully, uh, that's reflected. I'm about a kilo over the weight I should be, I'm working on it, um, but my heart beats okay, my respiration rate's okay, and I've just had my uh, blood pressure tested here in the Parliament last week, and I'm in the acceptable limits, I'm below 140, and the difference between systolic and diastolic is about 60. But that's not true uh, of uh, everybody in our society, and uh, people suffer because of that. Now, exercise too, we don't all have to be a Brian Whittle, who is a world-class athlete. I'm nowhere and never have been near uh, his uh, historic achievements. But at least I and all of us here can be walking in our normal day. My watch is telling me that I've walked 2.5 miles today. Look at my diary. I'm expecting about 4.5 miles uh, tomorrow. I normally am in the 20 to 30 miles a week. Just simply walking, doing my normal business, avoiding taking taxis. And I think that is a great help to my uh, personal uh, physical and mental uh, well-being, because walking is a great uh, activity to undertake, uh, to think about things and think through uh, issues that we may have. Now, diabetes is one of the major consequences of our being uh, overweight. And if we go again back to the period after the war, diabetes Type 2 in particular barely existed. Type 1 was quite uncommon. But we need to be cautious because the diagnostic tools were pretty poor. So I suspect there was a huge amount of undiagnosed uh, diabetes uh, at that time. Basically, it was diagnosed by smelling acetone on the patient's breath according to my father. Uh, but by that time, you were quite severely diabetic uh, and your life was really uh, in, in quite uh, severe risk. Sport too, 
uh, in schools is not what it used to be. Uh, I went to a very large school. On a peak day, 490 pupils would be participating on a Saturday in competitive sport. Rugby, football, hockey, and cross-country teams. Uh, 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 a grand total of uh, 490 pupils. That's not the case today. So I think a restoration of sport in our schools is definitely going to help. I very much uh, welcome uh, this debate. I very much welcome the focus there is on being healthy, taking exercise, and on good food. Presiding officer. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. I call Ian Gray to be followed by Emma Harper. Mr. Gray, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. And can I uh, begin by drawing attention to my, de in my declaration of interest? to my position as chair of the Hibernian Community Foundation, which I intend to, to mention uh, later on. Um, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to contribute uh, to the debate. We've heard uh, lots of statistics from uh, all speakers to illustrate just the seriousness of the problem that we have uh, with activity, uh, diet and obesity. Dave Stewart uh, told us that 65% of adults in Scotland are defined as overweight, and that it really means that being overweight in Scotland is, is now the norm uh, and indeed almost one third of adults are classified uh, as, uh, as obese. I guess it tells us that Stuart Stevenson then isn't the norm, but I think we probably knew that before <laughs> we started. And it, it, it's important to recognise too, and speakers have mentioned this as well, and the Scottish Government's own re research shows this. That issues relating to unhealthy, unbalanced diets often begin in childhood. Um, the 2016 Scottish Health Survey revealed that 29% of children in Scotland were at risk of being overweight and 14% at risk uh, of obesity. So in primary school, during those formative early years of education, it is indeed crucial that we teach children the benefits of both physical exercise and maintaining a balanced diet. Maureen Watt. Uh, would the member uh, like to know that I was recently at the Rowett Institute where they have found that a child's taste buds are formed by the 12th week of pregnancy? Ian Gray. Well, I think that, 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 that certainly illustrates the point that some of these things are set very, very early in life. I think Mr Crawford um, uh, made a good point that it's not all doom and gloom and we have made uh, some progress and he gave the very good example uh, of the Daily Mile uh, shown recently in research indeed to be not always daily, not always a mile, but indeed extremely effective uh, at raising uh, health and activity levels uh, in our schools. But it's not the only example. There's also the Active Schools programme, which goes back rather uh, further, and which uh, in 2017-18 uh, uh, involved 309,000 young people making seven, almost 7.5 seven million visits to active school uh, activity sessions. And I know that in my own constituency in East Lothian, this is a programme of enormous success. And so uh, it, 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 there have been initiatives taken which are having uh, a positive uh, impact. And that's true not just of the, the activity side, but the diet side uh, as well. In my own constituency, again, uh, programmes in our primary schools, such as uh, the Roots and Fruits Food uh, Collective or Fundamental Foods, uh, they both run in our primary schools uh, very good programmes, working with young children, showing them uh, how to cook, how to uh, use uh, foods uh, and how to make better uh, uh, diet choices uh, um, uh, when they get older. And... Uh, uh, that, of course, then feeds into um, uh, the quality of food which is provided in our school meals uh, and the availability of free meals, uh, free school meals. And uh, school meals have been mentioned by a number of speakers, but one important aspect, of course, of school meals is that you, they are only available during term time. Uh, and that's why in the Labour Amendment we've mentioned the very important initiative in North Lanarkshire, the 365 Club, which provides free school meals throughout the year. And again, there are other approaches in East Lothian. We have lunch clubs in the school holidays in both Trenent and Preston Pans. And these are initiatives that we need to encourage. But perhaps some of the strongest initiatives combine both those things. And that's why I want to mention the Go Football programme, which uh, the Hibs Community Foundation are currently running 
uh, in Edinburgh and East Lothian, where youngsters in primary schools are given the chance of an hour's football activity, uh, followed by uh, a session on good nutrition and cooking, uh, and then sitting down for a meal together. Uh, and in mentioning the Community Foundation, I also want to say that it isn't just about uh, children either. Uh, we've also been responsible for delivering the Football Fans and Training Project to over 560 men and 80 women. This is a programme which uh, most of the major football clubs in Scotland deliver, uh, which has been shown through research by Glasgow University, not only to uh, encourage uh, lo uh, uh, loss of weight during the 12-week programme, but weight loss, which is still in place there some 12 months later, uh, an almost uniquely successful programme. So there are programmes, presiding officer, which work. We know what we can do. Perhaps the most important thing is that we support a diversity of, pro of approach because this is a problem that we are obliged to address uh, and what works for some people will not work for others. And thank you, Mr Gray. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Tom Mason. Ms Harper, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I welcome this debate this afternoon, as others have too. Obesity is a serious issue which needs to be addressed. The Scottish Government motion states that obesity and an unhealthy diet are linked to harm, such as type 2 diabetes, heart disease, stroke, musculoskeletal conditions and cancer, and that's already been mentioned. I'm directly aware of this, and as a nurse, I've working experience with patients living with these conditions. 25 years of my career spent in the operating room, and much of this time both in Los Angeles and in Dumfries was related to surgery for patients with complications of type 2 diabetes and related to obesity. Many of the surgeries are not pleasant for the patients and the staff if we're including uh, some of the worst embolectomy, wound debridement, amputation of limbs and, uh, and other operations. Presiding officer, the way to tackle and promote physical activity, healthy diet and healthy weight, which contributes to optimal physical health and well-being, requires a multi-strategy approach. And it's really important, I think, to highlight that all of the amendments put forward are different. And this adds to the fact that it is a multiple strand approach that's required. And with the Scottish Government having outlined that uh, the deliver delivery of this ambitious actions uh, such as increasing levels of physical activity the aim to improve diet and a healthy weight i think it's really important that we use a multiple strand approach to achieve these aims i do agree that improved mobility potentially through appropriate weight loss can lead to improved confidence to support against falls and I agree with Alec Cole Hamilton's words regarding older persons' fear of falling. It is a major fear with, uh, which has been highlighted. And again, I've looked after many post-hip fracture patients and, uh, and uh, you know, sometimes the rehabilitation can take a long time for them. I agree with the government's motion, which states, acknowledges the shared responsibility across all society to help achieve this vision, including across national and local government, as well as the public, private, third and community sectors. And I'd like to pay a little attention to this. There are many across our communities who choose to engage, participate and support others through social prescribing programmes. Minister Claire Hawkey briefed me in the quickest of conversations before I joined Health and Sport Committee about what social prescribing was all about. And since then, I've been exploring how social prescribing can help in many ways, whether walking football or walking netball or Tai Chi. We know that it is not necessary to increase the heart rate to lose weight. Increase in physical activity is what can contribute to that. The Fixing Dad programme, which I've mentioned in chamber before, created by Anthony and Ian Whittington, who helped their dad lose seven stone, that's almost 44 kilos. They helped their dad lose so much weight um, by helping support him in a socially prescribed, family engaged way so that Jeff could get on his bike. And uh, I welcome uh, the work that Anthony and Ian have done. And I think perhaps the Scottish Government could review some of the merits and evidence from the fixing dad um, model of uh, social prescribing. From today, though, it's about physical activity, diet and healthy weight and the contribution this makes to health and well-being. I want to highlight the recent research published by the Scottish Government, which explores the link between food, the environment 
and the planning system. The Scottish Government consultation paper, A Healthier Future, identifies Scottish, Scotland's obesity rates as amongst the highest in the developed world. Developed world. And the consultation, which ran from October 17 to January 18, included over 30 proposed actions to improve the Scottish diet, lifestyle and reduce public health harm. Improving the food environment is critical to this aim and the consultation document makes it clear that a wide range of regulatory and other actions are needed to make healthier choices easier wherever we eat. Amongst the points which stood out to me included that access to outlets selling healthy food near schools was noted as decreasing the odds of being overweight or obese near schools and the closer a person lived to a fast food outlet the more likely they were to be obese. Issues of health and how it relates to planning is also something we took evidence on at the Health and Sport Committee. In addition, I love the easy suggestions for in increasing physical activity, such as simple things like getting off the bus one stop ahead of your destination. Sometimes simple solutions or suggestions can be the easiest way to achieve uh, big gains. I also would like to highlight uh, one of the actions I took locally. Um, I don't know if you've got time. I'll need to be very swift. Well, what I'll do is I'll put that up on my social media, but, presiding <laughs> officer, in conclusion, well, I'd like to... Who needs a parliament? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to welcome this debate, and I look forward to the Scottish Government engaging with members from across the sector, third sector and organisations, and indeed chamber, to allow us to create a healthier nation. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. I call Tom Mason to be followed by John Mason, and John Mason will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr. Mason, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The fact that we as a nation have a, pro have a problem with the diet and exercise should sadly come as no surprise to us here in Parliament. We have seen study after study, case after case, confirming this to be, to be the truth. The fact that we have two new delivery plans published today is to be welcomed, as they should be. But let us not kid ourselves that somehow these will be a magic wand, a solution to all our problems. Another day, another government strategy. Now, don't get me wrong, the ambition is laudable. I cannot, however, in good conscience, stand here and say we are making good progress. Life expectancy in Scotland fell last year under the SNP presiding officer. Fell for the first time in nearly four decade, decades. This is not progress and it is, it is simply not acceptable. We need to fundamentally consider how we go about this. And one of the key pillars here, neglected so far by Scottish Government, is the process of early intervention. We, we, we need to really spend time working out why school kids prefer going to a chip, for a chip roll at lunchtime rather than something healthier. And we need to work out how to tell them and what, what the alternatives are better. Because right now, the message is not getting through. Yes. I thought it was a no as well. Yes, Mr Crawford. Well, I'm very grateful for the member giving way, but is he seriously saying that it's the Scottish Government's responsibility entirely that people are going to chip vans, to fast food outlets, that, we're, we're, that the, the, the number of, the, the, the age of people who are dying is dropping, is he seriously saying that's entirely at the fault of the Scottish Government? Because I, I find that quite a ridiculous statement for you to make in this debate. Tom Mason, please. So we expect government to take a lead in these matters in order to show good, good practice. We need to figure out how best to convince people that physical education is far better for them than updating their Instagram profile. Too many are losing out and not nearly enough has been done to ensure that every pupil in Scotland has access to sufficient hours of PE in secondary schools. I hope this will be a key focus for ministers going forward because of the current situation where nearly 80% of school children are not getting the right amount of physical activity every day is not good enough. It cannot be the case, presiding officer, that strategies and consultations put out by this government are branded, branded as narrowly focused or bewildering. There needs to be clarity of objective at a much smaller scale than in the case now, so that outside groups can understand the specific intentions behind each individual policy. Again, this is a simple not the case at the moment, or at least not according to the chairman of the National Obesity Forum. 
Parents and families have a role to play as well. Even the best food education cannot offset a situation where parents are not providing healthy meals for their children. When more than 500 two to four year olds are referred to weight management service in one three year period, it is vital that parents take responsibility and heed the advice given. In addition, we need to have a food procurement agenda that puts fresh and locally sourced nutritious food at the heart of our thinking across the board in schools, hospitals, and in every authority right across Scotland. And let's not lose sight of the end goal and the opportunities that a healthier Scotland will bring. And at the same time, we can unlock billions of pounds in productivity for our economy and ensure that obesity and weight management does not continue to take hundreds of millions from our NHS, money that we know we can do put better use if progress is made on personal fitness and well-being. Providing officer, we had plenty of strategies but not enough progress. Too much talking, not enough action. We know we have a problem, so let us resolve to fix it, for it is too late for a generation of Scots. The time for action is now, so let's, get, let's fall, not fall short. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you very much, and I call John Mason, please, then closing speeches. Uh, thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. I think there has been a lot of agreement today, uh, maybe slightly accepting the last speech. Uh, but I'm not aiming to be too different uh, from what others have been saying. And I certainly do agree that with many others that there are a number of factors in our citizens achieving a healthy weight. Firstly, I would say that the individual citizen has a role and we as the public sector also have a role. That is what we have found with smoking and with alcohol. And partly it can be legislation, taxation, education, but it also has to be about individuals choosing a more healthy lifestyle. On physical activity, uh, Brian Whittle did not disappoint with his emphasis on uh, sport, and I completely agree uh, with that. And that's obviously part of the answer. However, I think it would be fair to say that not everyone is into sport, and there are other ways of getting the physical exercise that we all need. Uh, for example, in yesterday's debate on rail, I was mentioning that I had used the train uh, seven times on Saturday, and that also involved uh, a fair bit of walking because the train does not always go exactly where you want to be. So clearly, uh, I, I would very much agree with Alison Johnson, the idea that we should put uh, more into public transport, that will automatically, I think, uh, have a help on physical exercise. Uh, and I give that example just to show that uh, there can be physical, we can be physically active without doing sport. When it comes to schools and young people, we have the double problem of parking at schools and youngsters not walking or cycling to school. And I know that East Lothian has trialed exclusion zones for vehicles around schools, and therefore encouraging more youngsters to walk, as well as reducing the parking problem. And I do wonder if that is something we need to look at more nationally and try and roll that out, because certainly Glasgow has been a bit reluctant to go down that route. But again, a sport will be the physical activity of choice for many people, and I have to say I'm delighted at the investment there has been in the east end of Glasgow, particularly around the Commonwealth Games, eh, the Emirates, the Toll Cross Pool, and the hockey at Glasgow Green. Uh, but clearly, football remains the most popular sport for many uh, people, and the cost of hiring pitches does remain to be a problem. I think some of the things that Liz uh, Smith was talking about, uh, I identify with. Uh, uh, okay, briefly. Brian Whittle. Um, will the member um, agree with me that in, in, in our time uh, to play football, you can to put the jerseys down and have a game of football, but uh, these days, that, uh, as you say, hiring 4G pitches is, the, is now the norm and it's actually the, the cost of, of participation now has gone up. John Mason. Yes, I, I think that is exactly the point, because I think people's expectations have gone up, and, and that's good, and we don't have the blaze pitches so much now, but the new, new pitches cost money. And I know that Glasgow City Council and Glasgow Life subsidised pitch hire, eh, but that remains a big challenge still in poorer areas, where parents, frankly, do not have the spare cash for the kids going to the football club. And I think that actually also applies to athletics at the likes of Crown Point, uh, where Mr. Whittle and I spent a pleasant evening recently. Uh, <laughs> recently. This, this brings in the subject of preventative spend, which I think is one of the underlying themes uh, of today's debate. It is better to help people prevent people getting obese in the first place, rather than waiting until they are and trying to fix it. Now that might mean spending more on subsidizing football pitches, but the challenge is where to disinvest to free up the money. Should we cut hospital budgets in order to fund sports activities? And 
what would happen if that meant less money for the hospitals. Now, clearly, diet is a major factor, and we've been focusing on that today as well. And I would have to say, I think it's both a question of what we eat, but also how much we eat, which is, I think, some, of the, uh, some other members have mentioned that. I don't think the odd can of iron brew or bar of... I, I do think the odd can of iron brew or bar of chocolate is OK, but it's the volumes that some people are consuming that is the problem. And frankly, some restaurants are guilty on the question of portion size too. Even if the food is healthy, the portion size sometimes is far too big. And I have to say that in our canteen here in this parliament, I think we can be guilty of that as well. But I do agree that there is also an issue with what people are eating and we should be moving to promote healthier food. I would maintain that some of our traditional meals are pretty healthy, for example, mince and tatties or stew, and they do not have to be that expensive, although I take Alison Johnson's point, they're not always available cheaply locally. But generally speaking, mince and tatties for four will probably cost less than four fish suppers. However, there is an issue with traditional cooking skills having been in the decline, and there is a need for education in that regard. A, just to skip to the end, I think obesity stigma is a tricky area because on the one hand, we are saying that obesity is not a good thing, so we do not want to say at the same time that to, it's okay to be obese, but I do agree we need to tackle any discrimination in employment and potentially related mental health problems. I fear there are not easy answers to a lot of this, but I do very much agree with the overall theme that as we have tackled smoking and alcohol, we do need to tackle obesity. Thank you. Thank you. Closing speeches. I call Alec Cole Hamilton for the Liberals. Six minutes, please, Mr. Cole Hamilton. Thank you again, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, this has not at all been the pedestrian debate it could have been. I think there's been a, a lively and vibrant set of contributions from right across the chamber. And I've been re really been struck by the level of consensus that has been achieved. I thank Joe Fitzpatrick for setting the tone on that and very grateful for the inclusive approach to the debate. Um, and that is typical of his approach as minister that in the time I've had to work with him since he started. Um, I absolutely associate myself with the priority areas he identified around active lifestyle and diet, leadership across all sectors, uh, and linking government policy across portfolio. It's very easy in the dark vaults of government for people to work in isolation, but on something as important to this, we can't afford for complacency. Um, uh, he was right to reference the fact that uh, WHO have said that Scotland needs a whole systems approach and I think we see the measure of that in the, the plans that are being taken forward and um, he was rightly intervened on Miles, uh, by Miles Briggs about uh, price hikes in our nation's capital and I hope he will continue to put pressure on his colleague council leader Adam McVeigh to walk back any plans to increase the, uh, the cost of physical activity in the city. Uh, again on transport forming the food environment on focus on children and young people and on type 2 diabetes we need to work to uh, absolutely capture the the range of interventions we have at our disposal and in terms of children and young people and this speaks very much to my values as a former youth worker this is not just about looking to expand the daily mile but right across this country particularly for children who are disengaged from school who actually arguably have the the most most likely to have the hardest health outcomes we need to work to redress the systemic erosion of youth work that's happened in recent years and find means of boxing clever and getting activity to those children who need it most. Brian Whittle, who knows a thing or two about physical activity, as he never tells of telling us, um, offered some forensic analysis of the of what happens at school and uh, and I think that was a theme picked up by Liz Smith they both addressed the issue of that fundamental and undeniable link between diet and educational attainment. It's not rocket science. I will because I was mean. Brian Whittle. <laughs> what did he say? Yeah. You get, you'll be glad to know I'm not being mean back. I say thank you for taking the intervention. I think one of the things I was, I was, I was trying to talk about was, was the, 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 the way in which we discussed this. I, I, and I have to say, I like to talk about nutrition. I don't like to talk about diet because diet, in my view, is die with a T in the end of it. And uh, we need to start talking more about nutrition. Yeah. I, think I think that point is Alec well made. Cole Hamilton. 
I think that point is well made, and it, it speaks to the fact that uh, nomenclature matters here, how we describe things matters here. Um, David Stewart's contribution, I enjoy uh, serving with David very much on the Health Committee, and he knows a lot about this, he cares a lot about this. Um, he was quite right to identify the over-medicalization of some of these problems at the expense of that fundamental recognition that a lot of these are social problems, and they are symptoms of wider social problems, whether that's social exclusion, poverty, uh, and a range of other inequalities that exist. And he, it was important point I think I congratulate him on his dinner last night I'm sorry I couldn't attend but 260,000 of our fellow Scots are currently uh, suffering from type 2 diabetes Alison Johnston I, again you know I associate with that remark because I think the active travel really matters it matters in my constituency we have two of the most polluted thoroughfares in all of Scotland and one of the the five point plan I have identified is about investing heavily in active travel so happy to support that it's absolutely important but she in an exchange with John Mason also talked about the existence of something called food deserts. So it's very easy to say that if you can have the means uh, to cook a meal from scratch, you can do so cheaply and more effectively. But that's of no use to people who are two and a half miles away from the nearest fresh fruit and vegetables. For, um, moving on to Bruce Crawford's excellent contribution. Full disclosure, I did have the uh, mac and cheese. I went for the skinny fries, though. I think that counts, doesn't it? It's different. Um, we talked about the natural capital that we as a country have at our disposal in terms of physical activity. And I think we should never tire of reminding ourselves of the beautiful country that we live in and the uh, asset that represents. Uh, Liz Smith, again, another contributor, um, significantly more active than I am, um, took my intervention because, I, and I'm glad she did, because I think it's really important that our kids understand how the food that they eat in their schools and in their homes gets their plate. That will start a lifelong interest, which will pay health dividends. Um, I won't talk about Stuart Stevenson and the night that I ended up in the same Thai restaurant as him. He clearly waxed most of his ration book on what I saw him consume that night. Um, <laughs> Ian Gray picked up again on the school meals issue and I am delighted that we'll be supporting the Labour Amendment because it's absolutely right that uh, free school meals are only there uh, during term time and we need to recognise that that's a huge yawning gap, particularly in the summer months. Um, I'll finish with this, presiding officer. Well, I'd firstly, just thank Emma Harper, because her contributions are always very important to these debates. I think her lived experience as a nurse uh, lends a lot to the health committee, as it does to these uh, as well. And I think her insight, particularly around hip fractures and support for our uh, falls strategy, uh, is very welcome indeed. Hippocrates said, um, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Now, that's a very ancient quote, but it's still very apposite to this debate today. And I was really struck in my early days on the health committee. I can't remember who it was, but we had a leading clinician say that the six best doctors that we have at our disposal in Scotland are sunlight, air, exercise, sleep, water and vegetables. I can't think of a better way of summing up the preventative and proactive agenda that we're all forging together tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Alison Johnson to close for the Green Party. Six minutes, please, Ms Johnson. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I agree with colleagues. This, by and large, has been a very positive debate. Consensual, even though the government and the Conservatives feel unable to support my very reasonable amendment. Um, but, but the thing is, I feel I know that you both want to. Um, so I, I think we can get there. Um, but I do think it is important to discuss figures even in our policy debates, yes, certainly. Minister. Points I'd like to make is that the, the, the doubling of the active transport budget, um, what, what isn't in that headline figure is the additional leverage in terms of the, the money that comes from local government as part of the packages for those, which actually delivers the 25 pounds per head, which Alison Johnson is asking for. I, Alison Johnson. I, thank you. I appreciate that local government does have a part to play, but I think it's absolutely key that government show real leadership on this important agenda. Um, there is much more we could do together with local government. Um, I welcome the fact that the Minister spoke of the need to restrict the marketing of unhealthy foods. Um, Scottish Greens welcome this. We had a manifesto commitment for a levy on supermarkets and, and mass retailing of high sugar, high fat content food. And as he pointed out, there is public support for this because we all pay for the outcomes when people don't eat healthily um, uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, he also spoke of the need to change formulations and the impact on the NHS of diabetes. I mean, I think that impact, Dave Stewart spoke of this too, the fact that diabetes is costing the NHS and us one billion pounds a year. I think diabetes is worthy of its, of its own debate. But clearly it's obesity related. 
and it's relevant to all the issues we're discussing in this debate today. And it is a really important debate because healthy life expectancy has stalled in this very wealthy country. Um, we will support the, the Conservative amendment today because I welcome the fact that it acknowledges that inclusivity is key to good health. Um, and I, I do welcome the fact that, as I've said previously, Brian Whittle suggested he had huge sympathy for our amendment. Um, so I'm looking forward to discussing that with him at a later date and ensuring that we have support for this when it becomes a firm budget ask. I do think, too, Brian Whittle spoke of the fact that the school estate has a role here. I mean, nurseries and schools have a role to play here. We all do. Parents, teachers, the third sector. Um, and I think that, that issue of schools and their proximity to junk food is one we need to discuss further. I attended, I went to visit the, the Breadwinner Bakery during Apprentices Week in my own region of Lothian. And when I came out of that, you know, really impressive visit, there was a queue of school children visiting a, a burger van in the industrial estate. Um, and I have to say that was behind the school that I attended. So there is work to do there. They were choosing to leave the school campus and come into this industrial estate setting to visit the van. And, you know, I'm absolutely certain there would have been healthier options available um, within the school grounds. I think volunteering is an issue that's key to this delivery of physical education we want to see. We want to make sure that it's affordable and that those who've got skills to offer get the chance to do so. Volunteering is, is good for the volunteer and it's good for those who benefit from the skills that they can offer. I think looking at the cost of access to facilities is really important too. Um, I think David Stewart spoke about the obesogenic environment. I mean, today I have sat in committee. I've sat in this chamber. Tonight I will be sitting as I chair a two-hour meeting, um, a public meeting held by Spokes, the Lothian Cycling Campaign. So it's important that we have an opportunity to build activity into our days, wherever that's possible. Now, I now live um, six miles from Parliament, so I've cycled in this morning. I'll cycle home tonight. But I think we need to have a discussion about how we enable people to be active during the day. And I think we have a, a role to play in being the best role models that we possibly can. Um, I, I think um, Alex Cole Hamilton's ongoing support for, for a really firm look at falls and the impact they have is, is welcome. Um, we need to make people... If older people remain physically active, they're more likely to have the strength that will prevent them from falling and it'll enable them to continue to be physically active. I'm glad the diet and healthy weight strategy acknowledges the importance of breastfeeding. And I certainly agree that we need new specialist support for mothers and babies who've been breastfeeding for around six to eight weeks because we know at that point that's when rates tail off. And I was dismayed by recent changes to breastfeeding support across the NHS Lothian area where some much needed and well regarded drop in support has been discontinued and effectively replaced by a triaged appointment based system. And I'd appreciate an update from the Minister on, on you know, changes in that area and priorities in that area, um, in Lothian in particular. And I think the fact that colleagues have addressed this, but I think we have to address the fact that the missing ingredient in so many of our plans and our best intentions to eat well and move more is the lack of time that we might have in our days. As much as we want to, it can be hard to find the time to cook with our families and friends, uh, difficult to shop often for fresh food in the middle of a busy week, and difficult to prioritise taking part in sports or having the time to meet with friends who are playing those sports when we're feeling overburdened and overstretched. So if we want to improve people's diets and activity levels for the better, we have to be honest about the value we place on making sure that people have leisure time and the cash to enjoy that leisure time. It's fundamental to living healthily, but too many people, particularly those in high stress, low paid occupations, just don't get enough of it. And all too often it can seem that there's a tension between our working lives and living healthily. And while we can make changes to our communities and the food we eat in our workplace and the amount of time we spend physically inactive, we do need to ask whether we're getting that overall shape of our working week right. Um, a debate for another day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I call on David Stewart to close for Labour. Six minutes, please, Mr Stewart. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. As other members have said, I think this has been an excellent debate with well-argued contributions from across the Chamber. And there was a strong consensual spirit in the debate. And that's why uh, Labour are supporting the Scottish Government motion and all the amendments uh, that are here today. Although I note, Presiding Officer, that my spirit of cooperation 
has not been reciprocated by a couple of parties in the chamber. But as always, uh, I believe in the future that you should always support sinners uh, who would then repent. And as we've heard, uh, over a quarter of adults in Scotland are obese, and the Labour amendment has particularly emphasised the health inequality element of the debate. Uh, but members will also be aware that uh, being obese can increase the risk of individuals developing many potential serious health conditions, including, as I said before, type 2 diabetes and several types of cancer. But I think the key point is that the risk of obesity varies across Scotland, with obesity seen in 21% of women living in affluent areas compared with 37% uh, in deprived areas. And I think uh, Ian Gray flagged up a, a key element of our amendment, which is that holiday hunger is a scandal for school children that can be allowed to continue. And that's why I'd like to flag up the Successful Club 365 programme in North Lanarkshire, which feeds children to qualify for free school meals throughout the holidays. And I'm sure in the wind up, the relevant minister uh, will mention whether this can be rolled out uh, across uh, the country. In terms of the uh, debate, uh, Brian Whittle, I think, made some very sensible points about looking after the health of health care workers, I think is extremely important, not least in looking at the flu vaccine proportions in each health board uh, area, uh, and the important role of the third sector organisations, and I, th I think a point we'd all agree with, better use of school estate for sporting activities after hours seems very sensible. Uh, I think Alison Johnson made some very strong points um, about health inequality, uh, and I would agree with her general thrust that we should be increasing uh, walking uh, and cycling budget. I think that makes uh, that's a very sensible development uh, for the future. Uh, Alec Cole Hamilton um, uh, made a, a very good speech, uh, made the key point about the challenge is very high in that being overweight is the second important avoidable health condition. Very, again, he also stressed the importance of active travel and the link of poverty and social isolation. Uh, Bruce Cofford made a very uh, good speech, uh, a fantastic advert for his constituency in Stirling, um, and particularly flag up the important uh, development of the Daily Mile, which originated from a school in this area, and I was astounded to find that 3,500 schools across the world had copied that excellent initiative. Uh, and Liz Smith talked about her first, one of her first speeches in Parliament uh, was during the, the free school meals debate, and the importance of locally sourced food and the combination of nutrition educational environment activity, I think, is points I would strongly agree with. Um, Stuart Stevenson, as always, had a very wide historic sweep, if I can use that point. He never answered my point about his role in the Boer War, but I'm sure I'll find about that at some stage. Uh, but he did make an important point about the ending of uh, sugar rationing and the importance, I think, of um, the, the relative uh, low incidences of type 2 diabetes during the war, particularly because of the lower levels of fat and sugar which is a very uh, important point. I've already mentioned uh, Ian Gray in the debate, but he also talked about the Active Schools programme. And as a fellow football fan, although not his particular team, um, I'm very interested in what uh, Hibbs Community Foundation is doing. And certainly I'll be raising that with my colleagues at Inverness Cali Thistle when I see them uh, hopefully at the weekend. And Emma Harper, I also agreed with her point um, about the uh, Fixing Dad programme. I was at the Cross Party Group when that presentation came along. And the fact that um, we have a very strong element of social prescribing is something I'd like to see Scottish Government uh, roll out uh, across the piece. And uh, John Mason, I think, uh, made some very good points about the important levers that we as a parliament can do if we all look at the important role of the smoking ban on public health. What other public health solutions can we develop as parliamentarians, particularly uh, in public transport um, and in preventative spend? So in conclusion, uh, presiding officer, because time is short, um, health inequality is obviously at the root of this debate. Uh, poverty, social deprivation and inequality are significant contributors to those being overweight and it is the least well off who are most at risk. So why should your postcode determine your life expectancy? Uh, and as Martin Luther King said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and the most inhumane. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thought for one dreadful moment Stuart Stevenson was going to intervene on you and explain about his role in the Boer War but mercifully we were spared it. Uh, I now call on Miles Briggs to close the Conservatives. Seven minutes, please, Mr Thank Briggs. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, and I'd like to start by um, saying that I think this has been a useful and good debate, actually, this afternoon in Parliament. And to reassure Alison Johnson that I hope that one day we will see a Conservative Green coalition in this Parliament. So don't give up uh, bringing forward <laughs> your amendments. And it's clear from all the contributions that we've seen today that improving people's diets and increasing their levels of physical activity 
is one of the biggest health challenges that faces Scotland. The benefits of a person's health, of good diet and regular exercise are clear. The current health landscape and health inequalities in Scotland are unacceptable. I think all members have highlighted that. But we have the lowest life expectancy in the UK and the lowest life expectancy of most other Western European countries. Now, this has been the case for too many years now and the health of the people of Scotland is not showing the signs of improving that we all want to see. Two thirds of adults are overweight and almost a third are now classed as obese. What is even more worrying is almost a third of children are at risk now of being overweight and obese. Our record on health inequalities in this country is, is most pronounced in the most poorest communities which we represent. And this is a fact that we need to work especially hard to address. David Stewart outlined being overweight and obese significantly increases someone's risk and chances of developing type 2 diabetes heart disease, musculoskeletal conditions, and cancer. And obesity is the second biggest preventable, preventable cause of cancer after smoking, and is on track now to become the biggest preventable cause of cancer in the future. Type 2 diabetes makes up a significant proportion of NHS Scotland's drug costs. However, it is preventable and reversible, with individuals being able to go into remission with exercise and a healthier lifestyle. It's estimated to cost NHS Scotland now up to 600 million pounds a year. And for the Scottish society and our wider economic impact, consider, taken into consideration, up to £4.6 billion pounds per year. And I agree with my colleague Brian Whittle, who would speak on this for hours if he was given the opportunity, that improving Scotland's attitude towards eating well and exercising more regularly needs to be at the heart of our schools and our society. As many members have said, it's our responsibility to teach our young people the important lessons of eating well and to help them develop good lifestyle habits for keeping physically active. I attended the Hindu community's uh, Diwali ce celebrations here in Edinburgh at the weekend and one of the uh, values which I hadn't realised uh, which the Hindu religion has is that every parent is equivalent of 100 teachers, which is something I thought we should all actually take into account um, in this context as well. In what is the year of the young person, we also need to ensure that our school pupils have the meals and best nutritional value and access to physical activity um, that we can achieve. And I make no apologies, and a number of members have raised this, for raising the issue of access to our school estate. It's an issue which I have consistently raised, and I continue to see the limited opportunities for community groups to deliver after-school physical activities and clubs uh, here in my own region in Lothian. And it's also important to consider how every level of government in Scotland will actually look to prioritise the two new delivery plans. As I've uh, already stated, this summer the City of Edinburgh Council proposed price hikes to sports halls and local groups here in the capital. This proposal is, I believe, totally counterintuitive to what we are actually trying to achieve. And I'm pleased that following my intervention and that of other Lothian MSPs, colleagues, the Council have uh, now postponed uh, the increase uh, till January. But I think it's therefore important that in the coming weeks and months, the Minister and all of us must look to make sure that a genuine joined up approach throughout Scotland is actually taken forward if we're truly going to make sure that Scotland is a healthier nation. The, exp the expansion of weight management services tailored to support the needs of individuals is something I think can make a real difference to a person and massively reduce their chances of contracting diseases and are, that are associated uh, with being overweight and obese. And it's clear that uh, there needs to be resources and organisations uh, made available to help uh, build up the infrastructure around weight management services and tailor them to an individual. Um, I recently learned of a partnership between Scottish Slimmers and a local GP practice on the Isle of Skye which is helping to provide assisted weight loss uh, to patients there. It's this sort of innovative approach which I hope we'll see coming forward uh, out of these delivery plans. And for that cultural shift to happen in Scotland where people have better quality access to food, exercise and a holistic approach uh, is re obviously required. Scottish Conservatives have already supported a uh, banning of multi-buys that promote food with low nutritional value and are actively encouraging people uh, to often overproduce and overconsume. And we support labelling on packaging so that consumers can make these informed decisions. It's encouraging also from this debate to, to learn that a record number of schools are receiving Sports Scotland awards and a record, a record number of 309,000 young people attended active school lessons this year. In my own region of Lothian, third sector organisations such as West Lothian Youth Foundation are doing exceptional work here in our local communities. The foundation uses football to promote the health development 
um, of education for people across West Lothian. The charity has a range of initiatives and encourages participation and accessibility to all. In fact, during the course of this uh, very debate, uh, they tweeted me to ask that I advertise the fact that they're offering free football games. And they offer this to 11 to 15 year olds um, on every Friday. For those interested, and I suppose carrying on the theme of Bruce Crawford, Stuart Stevenson, and Alex Cole Hamilton, this is taking place at Livingston Football's Tony Macaroni's Arena tomorrow, if you have any time. <laughs> But it's these charities and these organisations, such as West Lothian Youth Foundation, that can make a real difference to our communities. And we should provi be providing them with all the support that we possibly can uh, to make this positive change. Everyone in this chamber agrees that Scotland's relationship with food and exercise needs to improve, and that Scottish Conservatives on these benches, we're committed to working with the government and all parties across this chamber to make that happen. I'd make the final point, though, to SNP ministers and to the government, that to produce these strategies strategies, action plans, working groups, task force, or the two delivery plans today is welcome. But to quote Willie Wereni from uh, First Minister's questions today, if we're going to make a difference, this is as much as a piano in a pigsty if they're not going to deliver the change that we all want to see and that they must be outcomes driven. If we can make sure they are outcomes driven, you'll have the support of these benches. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on uh, Jane Freeman to close for the Government Cabinet Secretary till, till decision time, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to uh, close this debate on what are two very important and interconnected issues that are so vitally important to our individual health, but also to having a healthy nation. And I'm grateful to colleagues across the Chamber for the content and tone of the debate. I will do my best to respond to some of the questions that were raised. And can I start, um, Mr Briggs, with, uh, just because it's in my mind and I hadn't written it down, otherwise I'd forget, um, can we uh, collectively agree that we're going to drop the idea of pigsties and pianos uh, from now on? Um, and actually, it, to answer your point, your substantive point, uh, the plans are outcome focused for the very reasons that you point to. Um, none uh, of the ministers in the health portfolio have uh, much time at all for strategies and plans that don't actually uh, have a purpose and that we follow through on. What is uh, important in this debate and important to recognise, I think, as, as colleagues have done, is that the issues that we're dealing with are complex and they can be difficult, but that is no reason not to tackle them. And indeed, in the spirit in which we've had this debate, it really cannot be beyond our collective wit to come up with real plans and real initiatives that we drive forward and that do make a difference. Um, we've said before in terms of health debates that one of the challenges for our health service is not simply to meet the health needs that people currently have uh, in Scotland, but to tackle uh, the generations coming behind us so that they don't repeat uh, the same problems that the rest of us uh, uh, may well face. Let me turn to what members uh, have said as best I can. I, I agreed with much of what Brian uh, Whittle said. Uh, it doesn't often happen, but it did today. Uh, I think it's really important to talk about the input uh, of uh, children into school menus, and it's also important to recognise that that is growing. Um, it's important also to recognise in terms of the school estate that 79% of primary and 98% of secondary school sports facilities are available to the local community. Where there are difficulties though is where we have PFI schools and they can restrict uh, those matters. And in terms of planning which Mr Whittle uh, introduced but other members uh, made the point uh, also in terms of what the planning happens around the school gates in terms of the um, fast food outlets that might appear there. Um, we agree, uh, and I also agree, that there are mixed messages then if we're saying to children in school, uh, a better nutrition, better diet, be involved in all of this, and then the burger van is immediately outside. And so we've committed to looking at this in the review of planning policy and the national planning framework, which we'll begin after the parliament has taken a view on the current planning bill. Um, what I think, though, is uh, really important about what Mr Whittle said was the central point, which is what drives the behaviours and how do we change the relationship that we collectively have in Scotland between uh, food, uh, physical activity, nutrition and drink and so on. That is the central point and it is the hardest one to crack, if I'm uh, perfectly frank. And I don't think any of us have uh, the absolute answer to that. There are a number 
of steps that have already been taken that are proving to have some results. Uh, for example, the mandatory nutrition criteria for retail outlets in the National Health Service in Scotland, which requires that 50% of food and 70% of drink uh, is, offers a healthier choice and has limitations on what can be promoted. The recent evaluation, if I can just finish, the recent evaluation uh, of that uh, initiative has shown that healthy food pr uh, purchases have increased in those outlets from 11 to 47 percent and in terms of uh, healthy drinks from 47 to 76 percent. So there are levers that you can pull that begin to help people make healthier choices. Yes, Mr. Hood. Brian Whittle. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking an intervention. I you to agree with me. It, it, how we frame the conversation is going to be hugely important. And, and, and to Bruce Crawford's point, for example, around this mac and cheese, uh, there is nothing wrong with having mac and cheese. I would suggest to him you should have broccoli with it and, and uh, Mr. Cole Hamilton, uh, skinny fries are worse. Skinny fries are worse, but uh, it's how we frame the conversation that's important. Cabinet Secretary. I agree absolutely, and it actually goes to a point that both Alison Johnson and Ian Gray made uh, in their own ways. I think Alison Johnson made a really important point about how we have this conversation in order to be very careful about what we're saying about body image and ideal shape, particularly important issues for young women, but generally for uh, everyone. We need to be careful. I think uh, John Mason also talked about not shaming people in this, and Ian Gray made the point about a diversity of approaches. Very important. You know, we can hark back to uh, the days, for example, when I was at school, I absolutely hated sport, but I loved dancing. Now, in some of our schools, especially in secondary school, dancing is a physical activity option. Uh, and indeed, I joined in in my local secondary school. It's, it's how we keep young people actively engaged in activity, especially as they move into secondary schools. Um, Mr. Stewart, David Stewart, I, I agree with much of your amendment. I simply regret that we cannot support it because it's deleting an important, what we consider to be an important part of our motion, uh, and that is a pity. But I am glad that you raised the important point about type 2 diabetes. The work is, work is going on uh, in that, especially, for example, in NHS 5, where there is a particular initiative, which with, if the data proves that it is effective, then we will look to roll that out. Uh, across the rest of our health service. Uh, and your point about holiday hunger is well made by you and others. There are a number of initiatives uh, going on in local authorities across the country that are, is gaining some momentum. Uh, Alison Johnson, as I said, made an important point about body image. Um, and and um, I welcome the fact that she recognizes the increase in spending on active travel. The problem we have with the amendment from Ms Johnson and from the Greens is that it seeks to make budget decisions outside of budget discussions. But I know that she will, and her party, I'm sure, will pursue that particular point in the budget discussions they have with Mr Mackay. I support the, uh, and we support the amendment from uh, the Lib uh, Liberal Democrats. I think Alec Cole Hamilton makes an important point in terms of the work on falls and fractures in the um, consequential impact that that work has in reducing social isolation and loneliness. Uh, and Liz uh, Smith and others talked about the importance of school kitchens and menus and so on. Everyone really touched on the fact that this is a partnership. Yes, of course, Scottish Government has uh, a responsibility to lead, but we need to do much of this work in partnership with local authorities, with our health service, our third sector, and indeed with the public and private sectors. Um, can I make uh, one po final point before I move on? A number of members highlighted work in their own schools, uh, in their own constituencies and regions and schools with the third sector and with football clubs. And I would make a point about, for example, the, the work that Cumnock Juniors uh, have undertaken, making a connection between schools and physical activity and particularly focusing that on people who are um, particularly inactive and on young women and girls. Uh, the, the final uh, couple of points I would make, uh, presiding officer, is that I think that we aren't going to solve, I think we recognise that we aren't going to solve all of these issues over the course of one electoral uh, cycle. But sustaining the momentum over the long term is absolutely crucial. 
it is important that we continue the spirit of this debate, the tone of this debate, in how we collectively work together, not only to deliver uh, the plans that the, the debate's uh, main motion focuses on, but also to be open to new ideas and new initiatives that other members may want to bring forward. And certainly, uh, I speak on behalf of my colleagues on either side of me and the work that we have to do, that we are very open to having those conversations and looking at those additional ideas about how we move these things forward. The core point, I'll go back to it, is, as Mr Whittle said, is about changing the mindset that we have individually and collectively in terms of how we want to live a healthier life. Living longer is good, living longer and more healthily is even better. And I commend the motion and indeed the debate to the Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on physical activity, diet and healthy weight. Uh, the next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 14762 uh, on behalf of the on committee membership. Could I ask Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau to move the motion? Thank you very much. And we will uh, move, we will hear Motion 14762 at decision time, to which we'll come in a few seconds. Thank you. So we're at decision time. The first question is that Amendment 14749.1 in the name of Brian Whittle, which seeks to amend Motion 14749 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on physical activity, diet and healthy weight be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 14749.3 in the name of David Stewart, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 14749.3 in the name of David Stewart is yes 78, sorry, sorry big one, yes 24. <laughs> Yes, 24. No, 78. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 14749.4 in the name of Alison Johnson, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to our division. Members may cast their votes now. The result, of the, vote on, the result of the vote on amendment number 14749.4 in the name of Alison Johnson is yes, 23, no, 79. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 14749.2 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 14749 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick as amended on physical activity, diet and healthy weight be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 14762 in the name of Graham Day on committee membership be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
We are agreed, and that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.